We hope that this event will be the start to opening the door to the beginning of those crucial conversations. At the end of our dialogue today, we will share resources with all of you. The WK Kellogg ha Foundation has a website which contains an action kit with a variety of activities, tools, and resources to help us navigate discussing racism, racial equality, and racial healing with our family, our friends, our colleagues, and our neighbors. We will be managing the chat for any comments or questions this morning, and I thank you for joining us today to be a part of this conversation. Next, I would like to introduce to you our Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Giarita Frierson. She's the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and joined our Seton Hall community in August of 2021. Dr. Frierson is a licensed psychologist and trained in health psychology. She's also recognized for her strong commitment to diversity education and research training, having worked throughout her career to improve the outcomes of women with breast cancer in medically underserved and underrepresented populations. Um, I will turn it over to Dean Frierson at this point. Dean Frierson. Thank you, Dr. Brown. What a warm welcome. Thank you everybody for being here today at our 2022 National Day of Racial Healing at Seton Hall University. As Dr. Brown mentioned, um, I am Dr. Jurita Frierson, but most people call me Dr. G. Um, so good morning. Um, as a black woman, a black psychologist, black scientist, black Administrator, this topic is so important at this time that we come together and learn from each other and have truthful, honest conversations um, outside of the classroom, but with academicians, with scholars, with students, with administrators, with staff, and with our community members as well. So thank you community members for being here too, from the Oranges, Newark, and above. Um, I want to also thank the visionaries who work behind the scene to make this day possible. I'm so honored to be here to learn about racial healing from individuals who are our allies in various communities. I also want to say too that we are thankful that um, our diversity, equity, and inclusion colleagues are involved with this process at Seton Hall so you can take the reins and really help our community heal and grow from today. And so with that, I will stop Dr. Brown and let Dr. Reverend Dr. Pritchett go next. Are you going to introduce him or should I introduce him? Yes, um, we will have Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Forrest Pritchett. He is the Special Advisor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Office of the Pro Provost, and he's also the Program Director of the Dr. Martin Luther King Leadership Program, and he will give us a little background um, on Amistad. Dr. Pritchett? I, can everybody hear me? Yes. Just want to make sure. And am I on screen, perhaps? Yes. Uh, I welcome you all to um, probably uh, what may be the world's longest struggle, um, as I begin to outline very briefly, uh, just the concept of the Amistad since the uh, the uh, director of that uh, commission effort, uh, Dr. Stephanie Harris James, will be here a little bit later. Uh, but fundamentally, I, I want to develop five concepts briefly as we introduce the concept of the Amistad. And, and that would be that we are looking at history of oppression that goes back to the 1500s in this nation. So that for the most part, uh, we have people who are using enslaved labor uh, to build great economic wealth. And uh, for the most part, um, when we think about the, um, the development of that slave trade and the resistance of African people, uh, we can actually go back and find that the first revolt that was ever recorded occurred in 1521 in, in Santo Domingo, what we they would call um, Haiti uh, and in the Dominican Republic. That was not a very successful uh, revolt at all. Five years later, uh, as the Spanish are attempting to cultivate the area uh, in Georgia along the um, Atlantic coast, in 1526, we have um, uh, the smallest part of the uh, Spanish army. They had 100 enslaved Africans. 
uh, that rebellion in 1526 was successful. Um, so that uh, that's a part of our history that many people are unaware of. We normally, when we look at um, the development of African slave labor uh, in the North Atlantic, we normally start with dates uh, associated with the English, which might be 1619 um, in the Jamestown of Virginia colony. Uh, but that revolt started a lot earlier. Now, just keep that in mind because we're now going to fast forward by literally 300 years. Uh, because in the uh, 1839, we have um, a small schooner ship um, that was purchased by a, um, a couple of folks who happen to be Cuban. And they purchased 53 Africans and put them aboard a ship called the Amistad. Um, and at some point, uh, that ship was not built for um, to hold in this context human cargo, it was really built for simply merchandise. Um, and in the context of that ship moving toward um, the Atlantic and North America, uh, the Africans discovered a way in which they could revolt. And the rebellion among uh, and that the ship ended up uh, those Africans killed the captain and the cook, and um, that is one of the first recorded rebellions that we have. So as such, <clears throat> 1839 becomes a, a cornerstone date uh, that many historians would, um, would point to. Um, one of the heroic figures that emerges in that revolt is a young man by the name of Sinke. Uh, he later goes on that case um, emerges in U.S. legal history because the United States uh, Navy, um, when the Africans demand that the Cubans take the ship back to Africa, um, the height of deception occurs in which uh, by day it would appear as though the ship is headed back toward the African continent, uh, but by night they, uh, they had deceived those Africans and the ship was actually doing nothing more than literally circling in the Atlantic Ocean right off of the uh, what we now call the state of Connecticut. Uh, the United States Navy confiscates the ships and the Cuban government then begins to argue that all of the merchandise, which would be the Africans, the human bodies, should be returned because it's merchandise. This case gets um, fought in the American courts all the way up uh, to the Supreme Court where ultimately it was determined that indeed um, these, the, the Africans were not, um, if you would, um, this human cargo, but they were stolen from the continent. And indeed they were ordered to be returned to Africa. But it took many, many years of those Africans attempting to develop the funds and the resources to get them back um, to their homeland in Africa. So we mentioned that the Amistad itself as a concept is a very powerful concept. It's a powerful narrative and story um, that is very prominent in the African-American community. Uh, later today, we'll be hearing from the executive director of the Amistad Commission uh, because New Jersey uh, does believe that indeed um, understanding the true nature of the African presence in the Americas is extremely important. Uh, this also would mark um, another important pivotal point for um, the state of New Jersey and particularly in terms of what it expects to take place uh, in the area of public education. In the 1990s, uh, they started a commission to look at the Holocaust, uh, followed by in the early 2000s, the Amistad Commission, and more recently, a commission which looks at sexual orientation and bullying. So I hope this helps all of us to understand the historical significance uh, of the concept of Amistad and the New Jersey Student Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. We now will have uh, Dr. Pritchett joined by Dr. Anthony Nicotera at, from the uh, Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work and Criminal Justice, and Dr. Zaneda Miller, um, from the School of Diplomacy, who will talk to us about reconciliation and models of reconciliation.
We thank you all once again. I'm going to uh, pick up that discussion by simply uh, focusing upon briefly uh, the types of values and the types of conflicts that people of African descent, whether here in the uh, continental United States or in the homeland of Africa, have been dealing with. As I indicated in my early comment, this is probably the world's longest struggle. If we take the uh, dates that I mentioned initially in the 1500s, particularly the revolt um, in the, uh, the, the area of Georgia in 1526, do you realize that in uh, four more years, we'll be looking at 500 years of resistance? Um, 500 years. So I deem that the world's oldest struggle. One of the most recent manifestations, probably of the types of values that African people have possessed around uh, their need to resist and to be uh, truthful to the values that hold them together, um, would probably be represented uh, by the South African example. So uh, when we think about South Africa, we think about you know a system in which um, African heroes defended their homeland from invasion uh, from the European continent. Names like Shaka Zulu come to mind. Um, young man who revolutionized um, hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, by uh, simply taking long spears and shortening them to make them hand weapons. Uh, but that was no real defense against using um, bullets and and guns and so forth. So with the um, subduing of the uh, native population there, uh, the um, a whole breed of folks moving in from uh, the European continent, um, representatives of the Dutch Reformed Church who were looking for land of their own, they seized the land of, of these folks, implement eventually a racial policy of strict racial separation called apartheid. Uh, they raise up a, uh, if you would, a new cultural group. Of, um, they rename themselves the Afrikaners. And this strict uh, separation of the races uh, is what we can focus on very briefly uh, today. Um, during the, um, the period of apartheid, um, the many, many, uh, People disappeared, and, you know, because of the political organization of that system. Um, at the end of apartheid, and I might add, what it took to really um, um, embarrass that local government was when the anti-apartheid movement um, circulated throughout the entire globe, and as international attention and more of a focus um, on that system. Um, it's an embarrassment. Many corporations stopped to do stopped doing business there, and um, ultimately, um, a lot of people also focusing on Nelson Mandela and his other African Congress colleagues who had been um, um, imprisoned. Um, ultimately, there was a day of release and a, a movement toward any form of reconciliation. Now, in one sense, since well over a thousand, almost fifteen hundred people had disappeared, uh, Native South Africans, uh, Black South Africans, uh, the question became: Could the um, uh, the apartheid government be held accountable in the legal sense for those disappearances, or uh, what would it take to help uh, the local uh, Black South Africans? Um, to you know, handle the trauma of those years of oppression. Out of the system of the values of those people, um, a value system had been identified called Mbutu. And it is through this, um, this value channel that indeed the spirit of reconciliation begins to emerge. Because if it had not been for that indigenous system of values, uh, and if this had just gone into the courts, we can then perhaps use models such as what happened after World War II uh, in the Hindenburg, uh, Nuremberg trials uh, dealing with Nazi Germany. 
Uh, but that set of values indicated a more humanistic uh, resolution to the issue. Um, and that would be that people just wanted to know what happened to our relatives. Um, so between Nelson Mandela and our dearly departed um, bishop of the church, uh, Bishop Tutu, it was thought that the most humanistic thing to do to help people to deal with their internal trauma uh, was to invite um, any uh, official of that apartheid system, any policeman, you know, the political official, if they would go into the local villages, which are so important as the, um, the cornerstone for building a culture, the local community, not national television, nor in national parliament, sit with the people, and explain your particular role in the disappearance and or the murdering of their relatives. So that this is a way to bring about in that context, a locally determined, culturally relevant, sensitive policy and procedure uh, for racial reconciliation. So as I end this, I'm gonna pull up five, I think, concepts for us to focus on uh, that trace the timeline from the point of pain to the point of reconciliation. Number one would be, if you look at, and I've identified uh, points of oppression, which starts this um, process. Number two would be resistance from the targeted uh, people who are targeted for that oppression. Ultimately, we get a, um, a resolution of the, of the problem. But then we get the repression, if you would, and the lying and the, uh, the denial of the truth by those who were doing the oppressing, the repression of that in their own memory. We can almost see this going on in America today. People do not want American history to be told from the point of view of being truthful. They would rather have it told from the point of view of their own narratives, which avoid the truth. And then the last phase, the fifth phase, would be the phase of reconciliation. The truth must be told so that we all may go forward together as perhaps as brothers and sisters in the human family. So thank you so much. I'll now ask Zenaida if she would uh, please join us for her commentary. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, did that unmuting work that time? Good. Um, thank you, Dr. Bridget. That um, works incredibly well with what I was going to speak about. So um, thank you for that. Uh, so I um, teach at the School of Diplomacy and I, I work in the areas of human rights and transitional justice. So what I thought was that really picking up on, on where Dr. Bridget left us, I would speak a little bit about um, this kind of mode of truth commissions as this kind of idea about how we think through questions around racial healing and reconciliation. And I'll speak a little bit also about South Africa, but also about um, some other places to which the model is spread and how it's been thought about. Um, so the kind of idea of these commissions, right, and some of this I think we just got really well from Dr. Pritchett, right, is that these are mechanisms that think through the ideas of truth, reconciliation, and restorative justice. So they have a kind of genealogy um, around the world in different places in the 1980s and 90s, and they really culminate in South Africa um, in the kind of particular way in which it was put in place. Um, um, and really made that country's own in the form of their transition. Um, truth commissions sort of operate at lots of different levels and do lots of different things, right? So they, they write reports, they are heavily based on the idea of victim testimony. So the notion that people who have been harmed are present to speak what happened to them um, and precisely in situations where people have been disappeared or where precisely that repression of what has happened to individuals has been part of the way in which a government has ensured um, sort of authoritarian rule, which was true in many South American regimes where truth commissions were instituted. And the idea was it made an enormous difference to have official acknowledgement of the harms that people had suffered so that the, there had been a double set of violence, right? There had been the violence that people had experienced and their family members had experienced. And then there had been the violence of being silenced and being told that what happened to them would never be acknowledged, that police records would be burned, that individuals would just disappear. And so the idea of these truth commissions was that it was really fighting on both of those levels, right? The idea of both 
individuals coming forward and saying what happened to them. And then that there was this mode of official acknowledgement from these new governments. So traditionally, it was often done in kind of the moment from authoritarian regimes moving toward democracy. Increasingly, then it was used in areas that were moving from conflict to peace in places like Sierra Leone. Um, and there was this, you know, but the kind of thematic that reached through many of them, and they, they altered a little bit how they worked, was the kind of combination of testimony, um, of the notion of a report that was written that both took in that testimony and also had kind of independent research and historical work that supported it. And then recommendations, right, to um, governments, new governments um, or changes in governments as to how this was going to be put into place. Um, so exactly as we were just talking about, right, in South Africa, you have this sort of really you know, unbelievable example of this. It was one of the reasons that South Africa became um, the most, and has, I would say, remained the most well-known example ever of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for many different reasons. Of course, some of that had to do with sort of the incredible power of um, Nelson Mandela, of Archbishop Tutu, of sort of the, the power and force of all of the individuals who had been involved both in the struggle and then in that transition. Um, it also was incredibly well publicized in the country, right? So this sort of ability to watch both the victim testimony itself, right? So you were watching on television or listening on radio to these hearings and also then watching these perpetrators come forward in many of these hearings and explain the horrific things they had done and then apply for amnesty to not be punished for what they had done. So there was, you know, at all of these levels, this kind of you know, and there is footage. I mean, if people are interested, the SABC, which is the television station there, there's a huge archive of their weekly reports. And you can actually, I show it to my students, you can watch sections of the hearings in which you can see the victim testimony, you can see the perpetrators testifying. And it is quite remarkable, um, just the level of that kind of acknowledgement. There were limits. So it should be said, right, one of the things we think about a lot with designing these kinds of commissions is the gap between expectations and performance, right? So there were many in the aftermath who were looking for a lot more transformation than they experienced um, economically in terms of racial equity, um, in terms of sort of the political economy in South Africa. And I think it's a really important note also, right, to think about sort of how we um, understand and manage what these things do, how they function, what we need to be paying attention to. Um, so the other kind of note that I wanted to say was that one of the interesting developments in this in this kind of world has been that this kind of commission, which we often think of in a moment of kind of big political transition, has increasingly been discussed in places like Canada and the United States and elsewhere, right, which are considered kind of much more stable democracies. And the idea is, right, what does it look like if we think about this kind of commission in that kind of environment? So in Canada, their Truth and Reconciliation Commission investigated um, a system of the Indian residential schools, as they were known. Um, these were, um, many of you may have heard, sort of as they, unfortunately, there have been horrific findings in the last couple of years of mass graves of children near these, um, the sites of these schools. The the TRC, which operated over a course of five years, it heard from over 6,000 um, survivors and witnesses who were speaking about what this school system had done, how it had attempted to forcibly assimilate indigenous children into, you know, not speaking their language, not being involved in cultural aspects, right, in all different ways, in addition to sort of, in, you know, increasing excessive abuse around them. And the TRC was this, again, a really massive undertaking at the national level in which they wrote a report. There were 94 calls to action. There was this kind of real um, intentional idea that this was about recognizing the harms that had happened to people, giving space to understand what that violence looked like, what the long-term effects had been, what intergenerational trauma and dispossession and harm look like and how to deal with that. And these 94 calls to action are sort of about transformation of society on every level, right? So they're about educational changes, they're about legal changes. They are really getting at the idea that this is both a long-term recognition and a long-term um, kind of transformative process. And there is sort of a lot of ongoing um, ideas around that. And I'll just finish by saying there's also conversations in the United States about this. So of course, this is part of it, right? The Kellogg Foundation and the work that's being done there. Um, there was a 
a state level commission in Maine about the foster care system there and abuses of indigenous children. There have been truth commissions in places like Greensboro. Um, so there is this kind of, you know, I think move in that way to discuss and think about how these kinds of models and ideas apply in our own society and situation in terms of this background. Um, so thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak today and for, for putting together this event, which is quite remarkable. Um, and I will leave it there to Dr. Nicotara. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, if you can go to slide one, thank you. I just want to say deep peace and gratitude to all. I'm honored to participate in our Seton Hall 2022 National Day of Racial Healing. My name is Anthony Nicotera. In addition to teaching courses in social and racial justice in Seton Hall's social work program, I am privileged to help lead the Fellowship of Reconciliation, or FOR, which is the nation's oldest, largest multi-faith peace and justice organization, of which Dr. King was a member. FORUSA is a branch of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation founded in 1914. So when Dr. Pritchett invited me to reflect on some of my experiences of and work for truth, racial healing and transformation from a global perspective, I immediately thought of two revolutionary stories. One, uh, the story of a transformational comic book and the other of a friendship across cultures and difference. I shared a version of these reflections yesterday during our MLK Day Symposium. I'm grateful for your indulgence as I think appropriate uh, to share a version of them again today. I begin with the story of a comic book that has changed the world. In 1956, Dr. King worked with Alfred Hessler, then executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, to create the Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story comic. This comic inspired the late Representative John Lewis as a boy to reach out to Dr. King and to get involved in the civil rights movement. It also inspired Representative Lewis to create his graphic novel trilogies, March, telling the story of his civil rights work, and Run, telling the story of his political and policy work for justice. In recent years, the MLK and the Montgomery Story comic has been translated into Arabic, Persian, Vietnamese, and Spanish, among other languages, and has been used to educate and motivate countless social justice and human rights activists and advocates globally, including many throughout the Americas and those who helped lead the Arab Spring uprising. In fact, just this week, the Fellowship of Reconciliation released a comprehensive study guide to accompany the comic, and it's a resource for educators, activists, organizers, and all interested in the work of peace and justice. It's available for free uh, on the resource page of FOR's website, forusa.org. Slide two, please. The MLK and the Montgomery Story comic also inspired the award-winning mixed media film, The Five Powers, which will be re-released uh, by FOR later in 2022 as The Five Powers Revolution, telling the story of the Montgomery Story comic, as well as the story of the friendship between Dr. King and fellow FOR member, Vietnamese Buddhist monk and Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, also known as Thai or teacher. Dr. King nominated Thai for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1967, calling him an apostle of peace and nonviolence. I had the privilege of working with Thai to produce the Five Powers film in collaboration with the film's creator and director and my former student, Gregory Kennedy. In the film, we tell the story of how Ty and Dr. King mutually inspired one another in their work for peace and justice. Slide three, please. Across cultures, across faith traditions, across oceans and nations with, that would divide them, Dr. King and Ty became brothers in the beloved community. Knowing that they were inextricably connected, knowing that their liberation was bound up together. As Ty would say, we are here to awaken from our illusion of separateness. And Dr. King would add, all life is interrelated. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For those interested, the Fellowship of Reconciliation is hosting a virtual conversation today at 4 p.m. with Bishop Mark Andrus, the author of the recently published Brothers in the Beloved Community. Uh, cover is here in the slide. It beautifully shares the story of the friendship in greater depth and detail. And you can go uh, 
join that conversation at FOR's Facebook page, FOR, uh, which is uh, FOR USA. Um, in fact, it was, in fact, Thich Nhat Hanh who invited Dr. King to speak out against the war in Thai's home country of Vietnam. Dr. King did so powerfully and prophetically a year to the day before his assassination in what is often referred to as his Beyond Vietnam, a time to break silence or radical revolution and values speech where he proclaimed, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. So in this pandemic moment, this moment of racial reckoning and political polarization, this moment of climate crisis, this moment when racially motivated hate crimes are on the rise, the story of friendship between an Asian Buddhist monk and an African-American Baptist minister working together to build beloved community offers an example for us in the fierce urgency of now, as Dr. King would say, of the possibilities of truth, racial healing, and transformation with Dr. King, with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, with Thich Nhat Hanh, and with sisters and brothers suffering, struggling, striving for justice, peace, and liberation in our nation and our world. Together, let us break silence and respond to this clarion call to global beloved community. As Dr. King implores, now let us begin. Let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicotera, and thank you, Dr. Miller and Dr. Pritchett for your timely and relevant presentations. We really um, appreciate that. And especially, um, you know, just talking about this in terms of where we are as a nation facing the pandemic and the racial reckoning. I think all of this um, is quite timely on where we stand as a community and where we stand as a nation. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Kelly Harris. He's our Director of Programming for the Center for Africana Studies with the College of Arts and Sciences, and he will introduce our keynote speaker for you today, Dr. Stephanie James Harris. Good morning. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, a dynamic uh, leader in New Jersey, Dr. Stephanie James Harris, who is the di Executive Director of the Amistad Commission um, and we'll get into that in a minute, what that all means. But in part of her bio, Stephanie, before, he, before she was the executive director of the Amistad Commission, she was the director of programming at the African American Museum of Education and Special Programs at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Uh, she got her doctorate and master's degree from the Department of Africology and African American Studies at Temple University. She received her BA in English and African American Studies at the University of Maryland with a specialization in Africana literature. Um, she also is the president and CEO of Imani Grace Cons Cultural Consulting, um, which, uh, which is an educational consulting firm that creates and manages a cross section of public and cultural programming, cultural development, as well as museum exhibits that does it design for various agencies and institutions. Her consulting firm was subcontracted by Bazan Ed for Paramount Pictures, Fox Searchlight Films, and Focus Features to create the companion educational guide and national curriculum platform for the major motion pictures, Bell, Selma, Race, The Birth of a Nation, I Am Not Your Negro, Marshall, and Lorraine Hansberry documentary, Sighted Eyes, Feeling Heart. And I could go on with a lot of uh, awards that she has a won, uh, has won uh, throughout her career, but we really would be here all day. She's that dynamic. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Stephanie James Harris. Hi, Kelly. Thank you for um, having me, and thank you for allowing me to be able to be here um, with you all today. Um, I'm Dr. Stephanie James Harris, and it's my pleasure to be able to really be here and be invited to have this conversation with you all about the idea of racial healing. And I love the expansion of thinking about even the Amistad legislation, the Amistad work as work of racial healing, um, because I think it allows um, people to really think about it in a larger framework and a larger context. 
Um, as as uh, Dr. Pritchard so eloquently explained and uh, Dr. Harris um, really allowed us to really see, um, the work of the Amish Education has been um, transformative in regard to the educational landscape across the nation. It has been the, the first of the nation K through 12 um, kind of effectuation of educational policy in which a state made a very conscious and conscientious decision with full intentionality to um, change the discourse and the trajectory of a content area, an entire content area, in which they said that the realities of teaching for, to, for our students to become lo global leaders and thinkers must also encompass the reality of truth telling and reconciliation, that we needed to make sure that the histories of our shared experiences were not divided or siloed, but they were taught side by side in our nation's classrooms, in our New Jersey classrooms, and that each and every space of representation in which uh, we are telling our students um, and sharing with our students those um, nuggets of knowledge that we consider um, preparing them to be college and career ready in their adult lives must include a diversified and demarginalized history of all of our collective stories. It seems simplistic. It seems an idea that I think most of us would agree um, would be one that we would want to see. But one of the things that has always been sort of the underlining ideology in my daily work is understanding that um, the work of educational policymaking and curriculum policymaking is probably one of the most silent political decision makings that we make. And it seems to be uh, the last bastion of a war in regards of how we frame ourselves and our thinking in regards of how we imagine the next generation will be able to frame their world. And if we do not deconstruct some ideologies in regards of how we create educational policies and how we create curricula, how we think about what will be included or what we will not include with our nation's students, then we will never get to the space where they will have a full understanding of the racial reckonings that they need to have moving into the next generation. You know, I come from a family of um, medical background. And one of the things that I understand quite clearly is, is that any cut or bruise that is necessary to heal must first be cleaned and rebuilt. Well, to heal anything, you must first recognize and acknowledge. And you cannot discuss um, the attainment of any um, equities or the reality of what uh, maybe even supremacies have done on this nation without first shining a light on the inequities. And that is what the Amistad Commission is attempting to try to do in a way that it really and truly understands that what we teach or do not teach our students is probably the most important decision that we make as a nation. And we oftentimes want to act as though that that is a decision that is done in a vacuum or innocently. It is not. Um, all systems, as we know, are created to support certain ideologies and education in itself is a system. And so we also must spend the time to shine the light on those in, you know, those inequities as well, and also allow a space of healing and reconciliation to happen in those curriculum conversations, in those um, resource conversations, in the reality of how we shift and change the timelines, the historical markers, the literature, um, the mythologies, that our students sometimes are learning. And if we don't, then we have adults that we are having to attempt to unlearn them because they become the silent markers that actually become the demarkers of their world without them oftentimes even understanding it. You know, the, the reality of such concepts is sometimes the cognitive dissonance that happens when we don't address these issues. Is, is that there is their after effects have long standing implications in a way in which we order our world and it is a cycle that continues and continues and continues. We oftentimes that we are now in a system of racism without racist. 
we don't need the actual um, folks to do it. The systems actually keep things moving. And for me, if I had to name my personal calling, it would be in regards of making sure that the next generation of our thinkers and leaders, those babies that are in kindergarten, and first grade and second grade, that are learning um, uh, whether, you know, inadvertently or very purposely, certain messages and things are shifted and changed because we cannot afford another generation to go down the same pikes that we have spent so much of our academic careers trying to unlearn and really fight against. So the after effects of this cognitive dissonance sometimes when there's a reality of us not being able to reconcile our histories and our thoughts because we're not taught them, we're not taught oftentimes in education to be able to question them or to reveal them, or we, we're not able to sit with the emotions that they sometimes bring up in us, is that we live in a world that is structured on the invisible fortresses of otherings. That othering that we often do, that gives us a false sense of the division and separates us from one another. And it removes our connectiveness and our ability to have empathy, our understanding and recognition of our shared experiences and our shared histories. And also being able to not repeat the atrocities of the past because we won't even face them and realize what they have done to us in our present state. You know, the idea of racial healing, the ideal of racial reckoning must also come with us addressing the fact of even understanding that race in itself is an artificial creation, one that we also often do not teach our students. It stems from a human desire to find a way to categorize and apply meaning and oftentimes we found that it has become a way to actually also apply hierarchy and social structure. One of my favorite documentaries to deal with with students is, is Race, the Power of an Illusion. If you've never shared that with students, if you've never sat with it, the four part, part series that is transformative in regards of how we recognize the illusion and the power of it and how it is shaped so much of our world, most especially on the Western Hemisphere, as it came up hand in hand in concert with the ideologies of racism and the ideologies of supremacy. The truth that oftentimes is that we assume that race has always been with us, and that is absolutely false and wrong. Ancient people often stigmatized others on the grounds of maybe religion or custom or class, but they did not sort people or according to physical um, differences. The concept of race, this racial sorting that we, ass we assess with meaning that we live with in our current space is only a hundred, few hundred years old and it's so deeply tied to the development of the United States, the Western Hemisphere, as it expanded on ideas of enslavement, that we can't even see ourselves outside of it. It is a European idea that has often happened in, con in, with, in concert with the, the conquests of the New World and the slave systems, the enslavement systems that came along with it. And it was often because they were trying to assess for these similar characteristics of those people that they were grouping together and connotating to this enslavement place and their physical traits, trying to find ways to assess meaning to it. It was opportunistic. It was calculated. And it needs to be healed for us to even be able to understand where we are. We did not have these ideas. They were created. And the systems that were created out of these ideas actually are the ones that still tie us to the emotional space that cause us the cognitive dissonance in a lot of instances that we live with today. But here's an irony that was presented to me once 
um, when I read some work by the historian Robert Kelly, that actually shifted my even my idea of the of the of the, my thoughts about this talk on racial healing. It was not slavery, but actually ideologies of freedom, the natural rights of man, that actually led to these ideas of supremacy. In order to reconcile the ideas of um, sort of the cognitive dissidence of creating racism and who would be able to um, af be afforded the ideas of the natural rights of man and freedoms. We actually had to lump and categorize those outside of it. So our attainments and ideals of freedom actually furthered the ideas of our differences. Our democratic ideals, the way we promoted ideologies of liberty and justice, actually furthered ideas of supremacy and division. And the ideas of unalienable rights that we saw were God given and a part of all of us actually came out of uh, the creation of spaces in which we said that people were not human and therefore not allowed those unalienable rights. So what do we do about that for children? What do we do when we have a world when we must unlearn those ideas, unveil those ideals, be able to unveil for ch children those hidden spaces where our systems are working so well that we now have racism without racist because they have perpetuated and go on. What is it the idea that something in motion stays in motion unless a different force comes against it? This is the point of what we're doing today. We are attempting to make the differential in force to come against it. For me, I think that comes out of the idea of education, a space in which we are confronting and dismantling those ideas that have become firmly, so firmly entrenched in our systems around us that we absorb them as children and spend the rest of our lives trying to reconcile them or deconstruct them, where our emotions become tied to their abilities so much that sometimes we have these entrenched resistances that we can't even see but because we fight them so firmly to hold on to those things that we are taught. So the ideas of the Amistad legislation, the idea that we would begin to teach and put space in their proper space means that from a very early age, people can see the collective contributions of all of us in with minus the divisions of the worlds in which we have created but we have also been able to deconstruct and have them understand the idea of causation, which I think is central to the tenet of any kind of educational teaching, learning and unlearning, because oftentimes we don't connect the dots of causation. Of course, for anybody who teaches history, it's, you know, we all, we teach it. it this happens because of an event with this happen and encounter with this happen and this happens and this happens and we see it growing into a global concept, but we don't do that. We teach history in a lot of times in regards of episodic or in regards of people. And everybody becomes exceptional without being able to even begin to talk about the causation that actually links all of these ideas together. Well, for the Amistad, we actually want to be able to make sure that curricula is created that actually does that work of causation actually allows us to see it on a global scale, not just American history in silo, but also understands that how those issues also effectuates how we are created, the ideals, ideals of how we are created, and so that we can see ourselves in, in full truth and reconciliation. So we can clean out the cut so that we can begin to heal and that we can begin to begin the process of allowing those wounds that are so firmly entrenched that sometimes we forget there are even wounds to close in our American history and in our American classroom. We must remember and we must teach, but that requires very succinct work. 
it required the Amistad Commission to be able to look back and really talk about the training of their teachers in the state of New Jersey and to be able to look at the retraining of teachers in regards of curricula and instruction and in regards of even what they were le learning as students in the classroom and looking at whether or not there could be legislation and there could be very succinct and purposeful work to have teachers go back and have coursework even while they're in school that will allow them to really learn these histories so that when they are teaching, because we recognize that textbooks are so problematic that they don't include this work. We have more than 56 textbooks in, in, in um, circulation in the state of New Jersey, and none of them are doing this work that we are asking them to be able to do. And if students are, are graduating out and are entering into the field, into the field of education and standing in front of students that have never taken courses that actually are doing this work for them and are teaching from resources do not include this work, then you can only begin to see how we are only perpetuating a system that will never get to us to the space in which we want to. It required us as a commission to really think about the regards of their training, putting them in front of professors and doing professional trainings and opportunities for them to be able to learn the hidden histories and being able to really be able to sit with and reconcile the histories in their even their presentations. It required us to be able to sit with teachers and really think about in regards of their own cognitive dissonance in a lot of spaces in regards of how to deal with this level of work and conversations with students, because we understand that teachers are grown up students. That oftentimes because we have such a notion of this unspoken race in, in as we have moved um, in what we believe in this mythology of this post racial society that we like to believe that we live in, it has now become silenced. And so if we silence students, very young about discussing race because we will if they even acknowledge it they're considered racist then how do we expect a grown up to be able to stand in front of them that has been taught these notions to have conversations about race race as an adult when their entire life any conversations that actually imply race is deemed bad or wrong we haven't even allowed conversations about the illusions of race and what it has done because although race is an illusion the reality of the perpetuation of what it has done how it has been utilized how it has been created as a power structure is not it is extremely real and it has long-standing implications on the lived realities of all of us and i say all of us because oftentimes what we assume is, is that it only permeates and has effects on the lived realities of those that it is directly implicating without understanding that our interconnectedness, the reality of who we all are as a nation means that if it is wrong, if it is a disease, then a disease, which we are learning quite succinctly in a global pandemic, does not just affect some, it affects all. And so even those that think that they are outside of the parameters of being affected by racism, because they think that that is not a part of their lived realities, does not oftentimes do not discuss or see or think about the reality of how the disease of racism and segregation, supremacy, actually has even shaped their world and their thinking as well. And that those, those notions also must be eradicated and reconciliation is needed. So the work of the commission has been on all of those levels and it has been done district by district, which has been extremely difficult because of even the reality of this systemic way in which New Jersey's educational system is set up. New Jersey does not have central um, curricula. It is done and the decision making is made in all 600 plus public, private and parochial school districts every day who have the authority to make curriculum maps, who are affected by the reality of political leanings, who are affected by the reality of school board and school board decision makings that could eradicate a decade's worth of work with the stroke of a pen or a shift of a, a superintendent's priority prioritizations or a school board prioritizations 
who can be affected by the political leanings of a of well-intentioned or maybe ill-informed parental groups that step to a microphone and um, contest the reading of a particular book or an ideology because they're uncomfortable with it without fully understanding why or maybe even the context of the importance of it in the larger scheme of the causation of a curriculum mapping for students. All of these things are what the Amistad Commission daily is attempting to do. It's attempting to pull those band-aids off of those things and heal them one district at a time. And it is extremely difficult work and one in which our ability to have partnerships and conversations with higher education become central to our task. You all are in the business of being able to train the next space of teachers and leaders, faculty members and administrators. You all will train those that will be in, in the leadership positions of these school districts in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and all of the thousands of children they will touch every day. My work is to be able to inform them and help them and strategize with their curriculum maps. Your job is to prepare them to be able to do the work of dismantling these things so that they are willing to take on the work. And if we all do not work in concert, in even this small, extremely populous, densely populous state, then what will it say about the work that we must do as a nation? One of the things that um, I always try to encapsulate when I do teachers trainings and I'm when sitting with teachers is a small concepts that is often attributed to the relationship with books. Um, one that is called um, windows mirrors and I've added the concepts of sliding doors. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but it talks about the reality of students sitting in a classroom and why the selection of books and resources become very important because we understand the power of imagination and what books do. They transform you and they transport you to other dimensions and other worlds sometimes that you don't see. And so if you think about the concepts of books being the space of transformation and transportation for a lot of students, the idea of them also being windows, mirrors, and sliding doors becomes extremely important. They are windows into other worlds. That is why they're so important to be in classrooms and why the diversification of them becomes so important. They are also mirrors for students to be able to see themselves and, uh, and know that others see their world. So they're mirrors that students can hold up to themselves. I add sliding doors because they also allowed a space where the glass moves away, the divisions move away, and students are able to move through both worlds. They're able to begin conversations and extensions with those that are in the classroom to the right and to the left of them. Or, for a state like New Jersey that is actually the most fifth segregated state in the nation in regards of realizing that most of our school districts are a apartheid level in regards of their um, populations and whether or not students have an opportunity to sit with students of other races and nationalities in classrooms and on the left and right of them, they allow those spaces become even more important because if they're not sitting with somebody, then they also allow the window and the sliding door. I always end and make sure that student teachers understand that. And I ask them to look around the room and to make sure that the resources in their rooms are windows, mirrors that will encompass and actually push sliding door conversations, relationships, friendships, curiosities for kids that are so curious in a space in which they are thinking about the worlds around them and the space in which the worlds are 
ordered around them. Race is not real, but the manifestations that have stemmed from race certainly are. And these are the conversations that we must address. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman wrote, to get beyond racism, we first must take account of race. There is no other way. We must address the legacies of past discriminations, legacies, attainments, self-actualizations, um, triumphs and trials in our history books. And we also must allow our students to learn the full histories of them. New Jersey's Amistad Law is the first in the nation in 2002. In 2022, we are still struggling with most state school boards actually still accepting it as a legal mandate and actually doing the full within full intentionality the work of diversifying their curriculum maps. There are only three other states in our nation right now that have even adopted the law. No other state in the nation have an office. I am still the only executive director of a state agency of this kind in the nation in 2022. We have a lot of work to do. And it starts with our babies. Because we're reflecting on, I guess, the legacies of Dr. Martin Luther King, I wanted to end with a quote or an idea that comes from a young Martin Luther King before he becomes the infamous doctor, Martin Luther King, when he was a student, just like your students at Seton Hall, that was sitting in a classroom at Morehouse College. He wrote an article for the uh, Maroon Tiger, the Morehouse College newspaper, as a student paper in 1947 on the power and purpose of education. And it speaks so succinctly to where we are right now as a nation and what I believe the reality of what the Amistad Commission is attempting to do in New Jersey and why it is so important that this work is done across our nation. The words of young Martin, just like the words of your students sometimes are poignant and timeless and sometimes need to be recorded for remembrances because you never know who you have walking across your campus right now that can change the trajectory of our entire world from henceforth and forevermore. And so in 1947, the student Martin wrote that education must train one for quick, resolute and effective thinking. To think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We are prone to let our mental life become invaded by lesions of half-truths, prejudices, and propaganda. At this point, I will often wonder whether or not education is fulfilling its purpose. A great majority of the so-called educated people do not think logically and scientifically. Even the press, the classroom, the platform, and the pulpit in many instances do not give us objectives and unbiased truths, which we need. To save a man from the morose of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to shift and weigh evidence, to discern the true from the false, the real from the unreal, the fact from the fiction. The function of education, therefore, is to teach one to think intensely and to think critically. But the education which is stops with efficiency may prove the greatest menace to our society. The most dangerous criminal may be a man gifted with reason, but no morals. We must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character and character development. That is the goal of true education. The complete education gives not one not only power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate and to focus their life's meaning. The broad education will therefore transmit to one not only the accumulated knowledge, 
of the race, but also the accumulated experience of social living and how to transform it. 1947, student Martin Luther King. I think he was in the business of racial healing. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie James Harris. And um, you can see all of the applause, the virtual applause. We're so happy to have you come in and dialogue with us this morning. I think I was looking at the chat and people were saying things like, I'm so glad this is being recorded um, because you gave us such pearls of wisdom um, and um, just very inspirational. We, we really appreciate um, you sharing your wisdom. Um, we know that based upon what you shared with us today that the work that you do is challenging and it's an uphill battle. Um, and and I want to open it up for a few minutes to some uh, for some questions and answers. But one of the questions I think I had for you, Dr. Harris, in terms of um, the pipeline for teachers coming up, what um, what, if anything, can colleges and universities do um, to help solidify the training and the presence of teachers that are going to be mindful in this type of work? I think, it, uh, so for me, I think the challenge that we have really succinctly looked at is the reality of their coursework, right? So what teachers oftentimes will tell me is, is that they did not feel prepared to actually be able to tackle these issues of this history because they don't even know it. And so, you know, and, and to me, you know, and I've shared with a lot of people, I cannot imagine licensing a teacher to teach um, science in New Jersey and they say that they've never taken a chemistry class or a, a biology class. Just not even possible. We wouldn't even think about putting them in front of students and saying, well, they can learn it from the textbook. We wouldn't do it. You know, we, we're, we're, you know, our, the reality of our preparedness um, stems from the reality of our certifications. We spend a great deal of time making sure that there are licenses and certifications for people to be able to do this work. And so one of the things that I think has been, but that has been very um, apparent to me is, is that it would do us a world of good to be able to find that, that a higher education institutions really looked at um, the composite of courseworks that students are able to take and they're able to fit into their schedules before their certifications, their licensures, their actual student teaching, um, it, you know, even administration work or curriculum mapping and pedagogy work. We have all these streams that students are going under to be able to go into the, to the, the actual profession of education that really need to be adjusted most especially if they're going to stay within the state of New Jersey. So that if they're going to stay and they want to teach in the state of New Jersey, they should not be graduating out unprepared to do it. That, you know, that is a dereliction of our duty as educators that are attempting to teach educators. And so if we could spend some time really kind of looking at coursework and looking at the reality of how, what we are fitting in and what students are exposed to and what courses can be included so that they can really understand the, these broader concepts before they enter the classroom. Um, you know, the reality is I could train every teacher in the state of New Jersey today to have a full understanding in September 1. We have, have a whole cadre that are entering back into the classroom, so it's a never-ending cycle. But if we could semi the tide and make a very collective decision that um, in 10 years, all the teachers would have a certain coursework load um, that would allow them to understanding that we understand that in the course of 10 years, we have, you know, 10, 10 cohorts of of people that have entered the practice that have a much, much deeper understanding in regards to curriculum and instruction and what needs to be included. And we will see the differentials in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, that will make permanent changes that will really shift them and make them a space where they will become intractable and immovable, which is what we want to see for this work. Because as I said, a lot of it shifts because of the silos of um, administrations and um, you know, school boards. And But how do you make it intractable? You actually make it intractable um, in the minds of those that are actually making the curriculum decision makings before they actually get into the work of doing so. Because if they see it as a given, then they're going to teach it as a given. They're not going to teach it as something that they believe is ancillary or, um, you know, siloed. 
it will just become an of course. And I, we, we, we need the next generation of teachers. I call them to become the of course generation. Of course, the, these people, everybody is equal. Of course, you know, race is, is illusion. Of course, we've all had collective contributions. Of course, African Americans, you know, have, have, have dealt with, um, you know, um, systemic racism. And these are the systems in which they've happened. Of course, we understand the causation of what that has meant in regards of our implications on public health or, you know, housing resources or education or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need folks to become, of course, but they won't do that unless we really begin to address it now. Thank you, Dr. Harris. I see so many comments in our chat. Um, someone asked how, um, if at all possible, to become involved with the New Jersey Amistad Commission. Um, I don't know if there's... Um, residents that can become involved in the commission or the commission's work, but I know that um, that Ghana Hilton has included that um, link as a resource if people would like to uh, review the web page, but is there any way if individuals wanted to become involved um, with the commission, is there any space for that? So yes, I mean, so even in regards of, so our teachers trainings and our, you know, our programmatic side, of course, is open to the public. It is also open, and I, I've tried to be very conscious to make sure that it is open to not only teachers, but members of community, community stakeholders, and also students, because I know a lot of students want to, you know, want to involve themselves and, you know, are interested in some of the programming that, that we have done, and we have benefited from the phenomenal lecturing and teaching and sitting under the tutelage of such brilliant scholars as Dr. Kelly. Harris and Dr. Forrest Pritchard that have been um, for you know, in a number of years a part of a lot of the programmings and, and trainings and retrainings for teachers. It is also a public commission. So it is, you know, it is we are actually um, a agency of uh, I'm, I'm a you know agency of the state government um, with a with public members that are actually appointed by the assembly. Um, the Senate and the governor um, that serve in a matter of commissioners that are actually kind of, you know, um, looking at sort of the policy making for uh, the commission. But I will say that the strongest advocacy that I will always ask people to say and to do is, is that this level of work often only comes because people in communities shine lights on it. And so one of the things that I always ask is, is that if you ever wanted to even do something that could be transformational for your own your own community, then go to a school board meeting and ask the school board, ask the superintendent whether or not they are actually have adopted the Amistad mandate in their school and whether or not you can see evidences of a diversified curricula in their school districts, because each one of us are tax paying or residents of communities that this effectuates. This effectuates every school district in the state of New Jersey, which means every single community in which we live um, is, should be looking at this law if you live in New Jersey. And so the most powerful tool that we can have is our advocacy. And that is the thing that I think will really shine a light even more so than what I can do. When folks know that people are aware, attuned, and want to see this work done, you will find that the political inertia that comes against the work lessens. And so I always ask and advocate for those to really become involved. School board meetings, look at the public meeting list and attend and ask the question as a public comment. You will find that it, will must, it must be addressed. If you return in the next month and ask whether or not as a follow up, can you see evidence or have they revealed it? You're going to find that those nine members of that school board and that superintendent are either going to start squirming or they're going to give you the data and let you see it and, and open it up. But it's important that we do that. Thank you, Dr. Harris. I see we have a hand raised in the audience. Um, I think that's Dr. Mirabella. Yeah, hi, thank you so much, Dr. Harris, for this presentation. We have in the room with us today a faculty member from the College of Education, and uh, she's very interested in bringing your presentation today to the faculty who teach in the social studies methods. Do you also come to campuses like ours and present to the faculty themselves, and maybe we can um, connect the two of you? I would love it, I do. 
I mean, so the, the presentations and the conversations I had, as I said, it, we always want to do this in concert and partnerships. Um, so we absolutely do come to campuses and have these presentations and conversations. And I will share that the web based curriculum resource, the online textbooks that we had to create as a model sort of for districts that would be in concert to all the school district textbooks that are in circulation also is available for any pre-service programs to utilize as a resource for model curriculum. So it is not just available free for New Jersey teachers, but any universities, libraries, um, archival houses, any space in which it might be needed. So students themselves can actually use their um, Seton Hall login and actually um, avail themselves of the resources just to kind of see the kind of data points that are missing outside of the standard textbook and how um, they can even think about how they could develop even model lessons, model curricula, model curriculum maps things and scaffold it for themselves as they're going through their actual coursework um, using this kind of work as an exemplar. Thank you. And uh, are there any other questions in the chat before we move uh, yes. to the next uh, part of our program? Lori, I'm going to combine two of the questions. Uh, Reverend sure. Dr. Forrest Pritchett asked if there is a uh, what percentage of the schools are actually in compliance uh, with the mandate. And the follow up question was, is there a published list of the mm -hmm. schools that are, are in compliance? So I will say to you that that is the work that we're actually trying to do right now. And as I said, the reality of the way in which New Jersey's kind of has been structured has made it very difficult to be able to attain that information because the idea of compliance can come in two forms. I can tell you the number of school districts that have adopted the mandate, the school boards that have actually gone through and they have just adopted the mandate on a board board list. Now, whether or not that means it is effectuated the class, at the classroom level is something very different. Whether or not you're actually going to see it in a curriculum map is very different. The reality even for my oversight and how I have to even kind of begin to think about structuring even um, evaluation or assistance with the district has to be tailored for each 600 and plus because, because each school district has its own curriculum map, there is no way to say overarchingly these particular facts need to be in each particular curriculum map. I can give them examples and we have we have struggled with this kind of um, you know debate even in looking at the as we have keep shifting and changing this content standards for the state. But the reality of the shifting and changing of the content standards for the states means that I have often struggled because I know that people are very concrete. And so if we shift the content standards to become less um, the attainment of ideals and leading them into regards of how we want to see them kind of structure a sort of theoretic understanding, which allow them to include the particulars themselves and, and make, you know, give them the framework, you know, that they need to understand the concept of, you know, American freedoms and the struggles for African Americans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we only, if we begin to include concretely people, then those are the five people, 10 people, 20 people, you know, 60 factoids that will become a part of every all the curriculum, which might be wonderful, but we all know that they'll never move beyond that, right? So then every district will say, yes, I'm in compliance. Look, I've got these 70 people somewhere here on the curriculum map, the end, end of story. And we know that that is not the business of how you need to talk about real infusion or that you need to really talk about the diversification. We are demarginalizing. There are stories and narratives that are permeated throughout. So you don't want to lead people, you know, directly to a line. So, you know, the long and the short of it is, is, is that one of the ways in which we are, are looking at it this year is, is that the equity there is an equity questionnaire that these all these school districts will have to go through as they go through um, their uh, compliance um, sort of evaluations. And one of the questions will now include um, them attaching the board agenda and the board um, the board mandate for the adoption of Amistad. And therefore, it will at least make that mandate become in the wheelhouse of the district. And once I'm able to have a full list of all of them, then I also will be able to go back and then do the deep dive because what we have found is, is that it's adopted by a school board in 2012 and you would assume that they are now 12 years or 10 years into a process 
But what the, we don't remember know is, is that in 14, a new superintendent came and they kind of put that table that work. And so you assume that, you know, we've got these gains that have now been dismantled. And and so there that becomes the problem, I think, in the systemic way in which New Jersey is orchestrated. Other states like Virginia or Tennessee um, that have statewide curricula, this would be, which would have been a much easier um, rollout and process in regards to seeing the statewide gains. Thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Harris. And we will move uh, to our next portion of the program before we conclude uh, to my colleague, uh, Majid Whitney. He is our Assistant Vice President and Senior Associate Dean of Campus Inclusion and Community Division from the Division of Student Services. He is co-chair of the university's bias education support team. And Majid, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Lori. I am co-chair of our bias education support team with my esteemed colleague, the chief uh, equity and diversity officer here at Seton Hall University, Lori Brown. Um, and I'll be very quick and mindful of time. Um, but while we have everyone's attention, I just want to remind everyone that at Seton Hall, goal four of our strategic plan aims to further cultivate and nurture a trusting and collaborative community that educates and empowers all of its members to advance equity, inclusion, and social justice in our campus and in the wider world. We understand that in our collective effort to develop our students to become servant leaders in a global society, we have to support a safe, diverse, and inclusive environment that is validating of all its members. and helps to ensure that our campuses are affirming and welcoming of all. When members of our community experience bias that makes them feel unsafe or unwelcome, our institutional values call us to respond with integrity and compassion. The Bias Education Support Team is a Seton Hall wide initiative that educates the campus community about bias and provides resources to report and receive support for bias related incidents. Consisting of a team of administrators, faculty and students whom members of the university can report incidents of bias, the best team will provide support related to resource support related resources to campus community members who've experienced, witnessed and or are aware of a bias incident. We will act as intermediaries and design programs, events and education and outreach initiatives to aid in the prevention and elimination of bias incidents on our campuses, ultimately enhancing the campus climate by promoting positive change. Um, if you or someone you know is interested in reporting a bias related incident on campus, they can report online. They can email us at best at shoe.edu, or they can contact Lori Brown or myself directly. Um, our information is there on the flyer. We ask for all of your support for this incredibly important initiative. Thank you, Majid. Thanks so much for sharing that information uh, with our participants today. Um, so I just want to say um, some thank yous to um, people who made this event happen and hopefully uh, we can begin to start this as an annual event here at Seton Hall and hopefully in person next year, but also to start to um, develop and shepherd in these courageous conversations and difficult topics um, that Dr. Stephanie Harris has so eloquently laid out for us this afternoon. Um, and I just want to give some thanks to the following folks and then I'll let Majid close us out. Um, first, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Stephanie James Harris, the Executive Director of the New Jersey Amistad Commission, for lending her time to us today, um, for all of her insightful information, her passion, which came through this presentation. We 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 so appreciate you being with us today. Um, Dean Giarita Fri Frierson, um, for uh, speaking with us and for welcoming us um, to our conversation today. Dr. Kelly Harris. Um, who was instrumental in bringing Dr. Stephanie James Harris as our keynote speaker uh, for us today. Um, the Reverend Dr. Forrest Pritchett, I'd like to thank and hopefully um, we can collaborate um, our events in a way next year um, together um, to remind our com community that we're moving forward in these discussions for racial healing. Um, Dr. Roseanne Mirabella from our College of Arts and Sciences, who's been a partner uh, with us in this work. We'd like to thank her as well, too. And Dr. Anthony Nicotera uh, for his timely conversation and his insightful um, presentation for us. And I really didn't know 
that Dr. Nicotero did all of this extensive work. So um, we're glad that we were able to shine a light on that and put that information in our chat as well too. Dr. Zaneda Miller, we thank you um, for giving us your um, information about reconciliation and healing and all of the great work that you're doing uh, for our students in the School of Diplomacy. I also want to thank some folks that could not be with us today. Dr. Monica Burnett, our Vice President of Student Services, Dr. Jonathan Farina, our Special Advisor to the Provost for Strategy Implementation and uh, Associate Professor of English, Majid Whitney, um, who's been instrumental in this work um, in our anti-racist training programs and helping to facilitate these important conversations on campus. And Ms. Ghana Hilton, who has kept us moving and running um, on schedule and all of her behind the scenes work with putting our PowerPoint presentations, our registration links, making sure that people were registered to attend today. Ghana, we thank you so much um, for helping us uh, put all of this together. And Andy Minigar, our Director of Student Services and Information Systems, who helped us with all of the technology for today's um, session. And we're so grateful that Andy was able to partner with us and provide us with this. I was emailing Ghana and Andy yesterday, um, and they were responding, being very responsive to everything so that we could have the event um, run smoothly for everyone today. And also, um, Mary Fisher, in our IT department who helped us um, with all the registrations and um, the technology as well too. So um, without further ado, I just wanna say thanks again. I'm gonna turn it back over to Majid and he's gonna close us out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, yeah, just to close us out, I just wanna say it's been an honor and a privilege to participate in this National Day of Racial Healing event. Um, at a time where there are days where our country couldn't appear to be more divided, um, I'm heartened uh, to know that there are so many of us who are committed to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in our community and combating social and racial injustice everywhere. I want to thank all of the attendees for taking the time today to engage and learn. I want to thank all of our presenters um, in general for imparting their knowledge and sharing their thoughts and perspectives. And I especially want to thank Dr. Stephanie James Harris in particular for being with us today and educating us on the significance of the Commission's work. Um, at an event that is sure to bring us closer together in our work and providing some context that helps us to better understand the importance um, of our work as we begin to heal and dismantle racialized and equitable systems that will undoubtedly negatively impact, as she mentioned, our next generation of thinkers and leaders. What better way to start a new year than with an event that has been informative and inspiring while promoting moments of reflection and introspection? But now what? What do we do when we develop a heightened awareness? We must not allow this day of healing to be a moment soon past. Rather, this should be a reminder of how we should live and continue to learn daily. A charge to be intentional in our work and in our collective efforts to lead with love and compassion, bridge the divides that exist in our communities and leverage our talents to create spaces that are embracing, accepting and validating of all. We are stronger together. I think it's only fitting that we end with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that always resonates with me, but today could not be any more fitting. And it reads, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot divide, drive out hate. Only love can do that. Thank you everyone for your time and for being here today. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Harris, for everything that you've shared with us. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day and feel Thank free you. to check out the um, Kellogg resource for different events that are going on throughout the day for um, celebrating the National Day of Racial Healing. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Ghana. Thank you, thank Andy. You. Thank you. And thank you, Lori, for your leadership. Yeah, thank absolutely. you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Love thank you so much. Great job, Donna, with your radio voice. <laughs>